My name is Matt Carter. I'm an assistant professor of biology here at Williams College, and I teach classes in physiology and neuroscience, and I've been at Williams for three years. My lab is very interested in how the brain regulates behavior, and specifically how individual cells in the brain, called neurons, regulate um, behaviors that you don't have to learn how to do, like um, eating and sleeping. The students in my lab have worked on a lot of different kinds of projects, and they've, they've done very, very well. So one student in my lab was interested in how hunger and sleep um, systems interact with each other. And so it's obvious that an animal can't sleep and eat at the same time. They're, they're mutually exclusive behaviors, and what we found so far is that when brain hunger systems are activated it really promotes this awake state and it makes an animal go and search for food and it kind of explains why if you have the munchies late at night um, it's, it's harder to fall asleep. One of the major techniques we use in my lab is a technique called optogenetics and this is a technique that's uh, very cutting edge and it, it was really just invented just a little over five years ago. Using modern molecular biology tricks, we can actually make certain cells in the brain sensitive to light so that they'll fire more in response to light and essentially control that part of the brain whenever we want to. And if we think that a particular part of the brain controls a specific behavior like hunger or, or sleep, we can activate this part of the brain or inhibit that part of the brain and see what the animal does and how the animal changes its behavior. Optogenetics is actually also a technique that mostly is used by graduate students and postdocs. And it's a technique that's very rarely done at the undergraduate level. And the great thing about being here at Williams is that it's all undergraduates. And so when students here learn how to do optogenetics after they graduate, they typically are sought, highly sought after. I uh, recently gave a talk at a conference. And at the very end, I put up a picture of everyone who worked on the experiments. And I said, something you might not uh, know just from looking at this picture is that actually all of the people in this picture are undergraduates. And there was an audible gasp in the room because I was mostly speaking in front of scientists and, and postdocs and graduate students. And they weren't used to thinking of undergraduates that way. And after the talk was over, a rush of people came up to me and wanted to know what their plans were for after they graduated because they all wanted them to come work in their labs. The students here participate in, in everything. And when I was at bigger research institutions, there were definitely undergraduates involved, but their role was a lot less, and it was usually to serve as support for the graduate students or support for the postdocs. And here, they own the projects. They don't just simply help with them or uh, support the projects. They actually are with it from beginning to end, and they feel a tremendous sense that it's their project. The best way to learn about science, and especially how science is really done outside of the classroom, is to actually do it. When you're sitting in a classroom, that's really great to learn the knowledge and to learn the basic facts. And it's a necessary component of a good science education. But to participate in science after Williams at the research level, you have to actually have experiences doing science. And Williams has been great because they know how to problem solve. I think they graduate not just having memorized a set of facts, but they can tackle any problem. I would say if a student was really interested in joining a lab and doing research here at Williams, the great thing is that the faculty are so approachable that students can approach faculty or write them an email or visit them in their offices and try to get involved right away.